Good morning. We start this morning with general questions. Question number one, Anas Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its assessment is of NHS workforce morale. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Scottish Government and the NHS Scotland recognise the importance of an engaged, valued and motivated workforce and that better staff experience can also lead to better patient care. Following continuous partnership dialogue over the past 18 months, we agreed with the trade unions that through the I Matter continuous improvement model, our approach to measuring staff experience will be greatly improved. This will allow us to better understand and take action on issues that matter to staff. Full implementation is due to be completed by the end of the year and we anticipate that the 2017 NHS Scotland National Staff Experience Report will be available in early 2018. Reports of previous NHS Scotland staff surveys are published online. Thank you, President Officer. This government has overseen a workforce crisis with 2,500 nursing vacancies in the NHS. That represents a 300% increase in long-term vacancies. Now nurses tell us that only one in three of them believe there's enough of them to do their jobs properly. Nine out of ten nurses say their workload has got worse. And now the Cabinet Secretary has imposed a 1% pay cap which the Royal College of Nursing tell us means that after seven years of pay restraint represents a 14% real terms pay cut. Why does the Cabinet Secretary think it's OK for MSPs and MPs to get an inflationary pay rise while NHS nurses get a real terms pay cut? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I first of all start by saying to Anna Sarwar that we have record levels of staff in the NHS in Scotland uh, and of course given the number of posts that have been created there are uh, some challenging vacancy levels and we're working very hard with boards to address that and indeed to uh, address issues such as uh, the use of agency nurses and reducing that in order to fill some of those substantive posts. So a lot of work is going on, but we have record levels of staff, particularly nursing staff within our NHS. In terms of pay, uh, we absolutely recognise that pay restraint has been difficult. However, uh, it was the unions, particularly the Royal College of Nursing, that wanted an independent pay review body to set pay. Uh, that has, of course, been the case for a number of years now, and the independent pay review body uh, recommended 1%, which the Scottish Government has accepted. In fact, we have, of course, accepted the independent pay review body uh, recommendations when other parts of the UK have not. And indeed, of course, that has led to the, the current situation where Scottish nurses uh, in Band 5, for example, are currently paid between £227 and £312 per year more than their English uh, counterparts. And of course, in Scotland, we have a no compulsory redundancy commitment, which other parts of these islands do not have. We are absolutely determined to continue to engage with the RCN and others about pay as we go forward. What I didn't hear from Labour during the budget process, of course, was any recommendations or representations about pay within that. Uh, so they come here and say one thing and say nothing during the budget process. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Cabinet Secretary how staff representatives like the RCN have been involved in the development of the new IMATER system for ass assessing staff experience. And I would like to note to the Chamber that I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary for Health. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, our new approach to staff experience has been developed over a number of years and formed by staff themselves as well as uh, trade union representatives. Uh, this, way, uh, this was to ensure that uh, measurement of staff experience is meaningful, with staff having ownership of the, the actions from that. Uh, the RCN, Scotland's uh, Associate Director, Norman uh, Proven, uh, said recently that our approach has, been, uh, has strengthened the process by which staff can have their say. Uh, so we take these matters forward in partnership with the unions. They've been fully involved with that, and I'm happy to keep Fulton McGregor informed of the progress on I matters. Mm. Question number two, Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what contingencies are in place to mitigate the impact on students, particularly those with upcoming exams, of reported planned strikes by college lecturers. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. I am pleased to note today's news that the Employers Association and the EIS FILA have jointly decided to refer their dispute to the conciliation service ACAS. I hope that this will encourage both sides to work constructively to reach a resolution to this dispute. 
while the Union has a mandate for strike action, I hope they will consider postponing this while the ACAS process is in train. In the event of strike action going ahead, Colleges Scotland Employers Association has issued comprehensive guidance on the practical steps colleges should take to mitigate against the risk of disruption to students. And this includes what colleges can do to ensure that no student has their exam diet disrupted. Boston. I thank the Minister for that answer and welcome um, that good news and that good progress. Uh, would the Minister acknowledge that there are still serious concerns within the sector around college funding yep. and their sustainability, as well as a genuine concern around the 54% reduction of part-time and flexible courses between 2007 and 2016, and these need to be addressed properly? Minister. Well, of course, in challenging financial times, the 2017-18 budget for colleges will increase resource and capital funding by £41.4 million. That's a 7.4% increase in cash terms. And we have increased our college capital spending in this budget too. I recognise the member says these are challenging times and we are delivering for the college sector at that time. He refers to the uh, types of college places that we have. We do, of course, fund part-time and full-time college courses. This is to do with the courses being focused on those which receive a recognised qualification, enhancing the prospect of people going directly into jobs and successfully into the jobs market following that degree qualification. Question number three, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to automating some benefits such as school clothing grants, free school meals and the educational maintenance allowance to increase the uptake by those most in need. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. So the, officer, the automation of benefits is a matter for local authorities to decide, taking into account local needs and priorities. The Scottish Government is always keen to see improvements in the delivery and take-up of passport benefits which are handled by local authorities or other public bodies. Pauline McNeill. The poorest in Scotland are missing out on £2 billion of unclaimed benefits each year. Last year, Glasgow City Council had a scheme to automate the school clothing grant, which meant they could send £52 per child to each family. And the financial inclusion team at Glasgow site is some of the biggest reasons why people don't claim, as being complex form language difficulties, or people are worried about losing other benefits. Notwithstanding what the Cabinet Secretary has said, that it is the responsibility of local authorities. Would the Cabinet Secretary commit to talking to authorities such as Glasgow to get a better understanding of how successful this has been? And would he consider that actually there's quite a compelling case for the government to place a duty or to look at it in the context of the Child Poverty Bill? Because if we can get more people to claim their benefits that they are entitled to, and if you look at the reasons why people are not claiming, we can take more people out of poverty. Cabinet Secretary. The, 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 the substance and the purpose of uh, Pauline McNeill's question is one with which I am happy to associate myself and the government. That it is important that in all circumstances, individuals are able to receive the benefits to which they are properly and fully entitled. And um, I am obviously aware of the fact that in some circumstances individuals are not claiming benefits to which they are entitled and these could make a material difference in their lives. Uh, I'm certainly very happy to talk to Glasgow City Council and other authorities about how we strengthen and improve uh, take up of individual benefits. And of course we are going into a period now where there is greater uh, a greater ability to exercise responsibility over a range of integrated benefits within the, uh, the competence that the Scottish Government now has. So, with these comments, I'm happy to engage with Paul McNeill and with others on this question because it's clear to me from exercises that we look at, for example, in connection with the cost of the, the school day, that these are significant financial burdens for families, and the more we can do to support individuals, uh, the better. Question four has not been lodged. Question five, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update regarding uh, Glasgow Kelvin College's request to retain three million pounds from the sale of the Stowe College building. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. <coughs> the board of Glasgow Kelvin College achieved a six million pound from the sale of the former Stowe College building. 
There was an initial agreement to retain £3 million of those proceeds to support the capital state requirements in the Glasgow Kelvin Board area. Following a consultation between the Scottish Government and Glasgow Kelvin College Board of Management, a further £1 million has been retained by the College, bringing the total retained proceeds to £4 million. Adam Tompkins. I'm grateful to the Minister for that answer. Glasgow Kelvin College serves some of the most disadvantaged communities in Scotland. 65% of its learners come from the 20% most deprived communities in Glasgow or in the Glasgow region. This £3 million could have been invested, could and should have been invested, uh, in its own estate and capital equipment to meet the needs of, of existing learners and, crucially, to increase levels of participation from deprived areas. Instead, the Scottish Government disregarded decision makers on the ground and cross subsidised another educational institution in a different part of Scotland altogether. Does the Minister was, will the Minister reconsider this decision and can she advise if this transfer of resources is now set to become common practice in Scotland? Minister. Well, Adam Tompkins may be um, aware of what's going up in Glasgow Kelvin College, but I think he's been uh, rather um, disingenuous with some of the detail. Can I quote to him a, a letter I received uh, from the Chair of the Board of Management on 24th of March? where he welcomes the Scottish Government uh, recognising and supporting the work of the College <clears throat> by allocating these resources, which will enable learners to access to industry standard equipment to provide them with the skills needed for sustainable employment in STEM-related industries. I have visited the College myself. I have seen the fantastic work that they do do with the, the learners which Mr Tompkins discusses, um, and I will be more than happy to continue that dialogue with the College over the years ahead. Bob Joris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Of course, Mr Tompkins' party is responsible for much of that deprivation. And unlike myself, Mr Tompkins has had no discussions with the principal of Glasgow Kelvin College. I want to thank the Minister for responding positively to my concerns about the issue for Glasgow Kelvin College and working with me and the College to resolve the matter successfully with an additional £1 million being secured for the College. The College has welcomed the outcome, but can the Minister advise what the statutory arrangements are for the treatment of such capital receipts in the College sector more generally? Has such treatment been applied to other sectors? And can she further advise how much this Government has invested in recent years in improving the states within Glasgow Colleges? Minister. Well, I do recognise the ongoing work that uh, Bob Doris has had with me and with the College over this issue, uh, and I welcome the, the discussions that I have had with him. The statutory arrangements for capital disposals in the further education sector are covered in the statutory powers under Section 18.5 of the Further and Higher Education Scotland Act 1992. Disposal of assets in other sectors would be dealt with in line with the conditions set out in the Scottish Public Finance Manual. <clears throat> Bob Doris rightly points out to the investment which this government has made into the college estate in Glasgow. £272 million in buildings in the college estate, including the Riverside campus, the city campus, Langside College buildings, and of course £16 million for capital maintenance. This government has a proud record for delivering for Glasgow and the college estate within Scotland. Question number six, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. It's to ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to ensure that homes in the private rented sector are energy efficient. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, we have designated energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority, recognising its key role in tackling fuel poverty and meeting our ambitious climate change targets. Private renting now makes up 14% of Scotland's homes uh, and is an increasingly important housing option for many people in Scotland. The sector has the highest proportion of the least energy efficient stock and it is only fair that tenants who rent privately have access to a good quality and energy efficient home. Our Home Energy Efficiency Programmes for Scotland scheme provides support for householders across all tenures, including private rented sector tenants. And we have just published a consultation on proposals that would mean that all privately rented homes in Scotland uh, would be required to meet a minimum standard of energy efficiency. The consultation seeks views on requiring all private rented sector properties to have a minimum energy performance certificate, EPC rating of E, uh, a change in tenancy from 2019, rising to EPC level D from 2022. Emma Harper. I thank the Minister for that answer. 
The British Lung Foundation in Scotland have said that cold, damp and mouldy homes can cause and exacerbate illnesses, including lung diseases, which places additional strain on our health and social services. Will the Minister be taking into account the health benefits for private sector tenants of the improved energy efficiency of their homes when considering the response to the consultation? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The, the Scottish Government uh, already recognises the importance of energy efficiency measures in helping individuals feel healthier uh, and to live in warmer homes that are cheaper to heat. Um, I would encourage any tenant that has any issue with dampness to report it immediately to their landlord. Both social and private landlords have responsibility to ensure their, the homes their tenants live in uh, are in a good state of repair uh, and, under the and under the statutory minimum tolerable standard for all housing, homes must be substantially free from rising damp or penetrating damp. When it comes to our current consultation, we would be very much welcome views from all stakeholders, including landlords, tenants, uh, as well as other interested parties, including bodies such as the British Lung Foundation Scotland. We will, of course, consider carefully all views in our response to the consultation. Graeme Simpson. Um, we welcome the consultation uh, on this, uh, although it was a long time coming. Regulations covering the private rented sector have already been introduced in England and Wales by the UK Government. The 2015 Energy Efficiency Regulations make it unlawful for landlords in England and Wales to grant a new lease of property with uh, an EPC rating below E from April next year. So will the Scottish Government study best practice from elsewhere in the UK before drawing up its own proposals? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the UK Government, as uh, Mr Simpson has said, has set a minimum energy efficiency standard in England and Wales, uh, EPC Band E for the private rent rented sector, uh, from April 2018. Our state start date of 1st of April 2019 uh, will allow landlords, assessors and installers uh, time to prepare for minimum standards. Uh, but at the same time ensure that tenants' homes are improved as soon as possible. Our proposals also set out a trajectory uh, to increase the standard over time, going beyond the current standards in England and Wales. Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister uh, what the Scottish Government's approach will be to rural off-gas grid rented properties? many of which have missed out on successive home energy efficiency schemes. Minister. Uh, we have certainly taken cognizance uh, of some of the findings of the uh, Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force. Uh, and we, will, we have said that we will look at uh, those houses that are off-grid. Uh, I'm very pleased to have received information as well as from uh, the task force itself, but from organisations who are doing on-the-ground work, uh, such as in East Sutherland. Uh, and we will look very closely at what these folks in the, uh, on the ground are finding and act accordingly. Andy Whiteman. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister explain why there is such a continuing delay in regulating energy efficiency in the owner-occupied sector? 59% of those in fuel poverty live in that sector, and as WWF uh, indicated in their evidence on the draft climate change plan, these powers have been in existence since 2009. It was an enabling measure in RPPB1. It was a concrete proposal in RPPB2. It was developed with stakeholders to detailed pre-consultation phase in the last Parliament. On the current proposals, nothing will happen until at least 2019, a decade after the Act. Why is the government so complacent in this regard? Uh, as Mr Whiteman is very well aware, uh, presiding officer, uh, we have set out a timetable of how we will deal uh, with houses in uh, owner occupation uh, as part of the consultation that we published uh, just the other week. Uh, we are absolutely adamant to ensure uh, that we get all of these proposals absolutely right. I would encourage folk to uh, look at the current consultation uh, on the private housing sector uh, and respond uh, accordingly, uh, and then we will move on to looking at owner-occupier properties.